Uh, for today's uh, presentation, I'll be sharing uh, research with you that is uh, the crux of uh, the topic of my first book, uh, which is uh, about this idea of uh, knowledge transfers and power building. Uh, as um, the, the title suggests, I, I, I um, want to investigate or to look at uh, investments, China's investments in Africa by uh, looking at an uh, oftentimes uh, unresearched or under-considered uh, uh, topic, which is this idea of capacity building programs. So essentially, uh, whenever we talk about China's investments in Africa, whenever we look at the media, uh, what, what comes out whenever we, we Google Chinese investments in Africa? Images uh, of China's investments in Africa often have to do with buildings. Right? So this is the headquarters of the African Union, which is located in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, which is a gift of China, $200 million gift by the Chinese government to the African Union, built by, uh, by China. Uh, again, this was an article in the New York Times that they're talking about this train uh, the, 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 the train that connects Djibouti to Ethiopia and we know that Ethiopia is a landlocked country so connecting railway Ethiopia to Djibouti opens up uh, Ethiopia's economy to the port um, so that's sort of a big also infrastructure project that has been built by, by Chinese companies with lots of uh, loans from, from China. I was actually in Djibouti last week so I got to see the, the train uh, and I got to see uh, some of these investments. Uh, you see uh, ports, this was the Tanzania port. Uh, there are ports also in Djibouti that were built and are being constructed by Chinese firms. This was a, a, a wrestling arena that was just the subject of, um, uh, was inaugurated by Xi Jinping during his latest visit to Senegal uh, just a few weeks ago when he was uh, visiting Senegal. Uh, so these are the sort of the images, right? So these are the typical images of what we see in the media when we want to understand China's investments in Africa. Again, more railways, constructions, right? Um, uh, this was a New York piece that also shows these constructions and, um, and investments, right? But what I'm interested in, of course, we look at these uh, investments here from transport to energy to metals to utilities, technology, my colleague who's going to speak next uh, is an expert on oil and natural resources, will tell us a lot more about these. But what I'm really interested in is what we don't see. Right? So these are material investments. right? So this is cement, these are infrastructure projects, railway, but is China doing only that? Is it all about cement? It is, on, is it all only about these uh, bricks and buildings? Or, or is there something else? This, is there some an intangible aspect of China's elements in uh, investments in Africa that we do not see in the media. So that's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm interested in looking at beyond cement, right? Beyond these material constructions. What else is going on? So we see these railways, but is that it? Hospitals, the schools, the headquarters of the, of the African Union. What else is going on is what I want to ask. And by exploring that question of what else is going on, um, I look at these professionalization training programs. So there's a whole set of investments by the Chinese government in Africa which are mostly uh, concerned with um, human development, right? So it's, it's human resource investments and not necessarily uh, material construction kind of investments, right? Or natural resource investments. Uh, so I, I look at these professionalization trainings. Um, I, I ask the question, uh, I'm curious about uh, you know, who are these uh, trainings meant for, what's the audience, what are the numbers, uh, how are these organized, where are they organized, how often are they organized, uh, what are the sort of the, the, the processes. Uh, and so this is the topic of the, the, my, my, the, my first book project, and I look at different cases within these professionalization trainings. I find that professionalization trainings by China to African, uh, uh, Africans uh, spans across every single uh, uh, expertise in life you can imagine, from sports medicine to public official trainings to peacekeepers to uh, uh, journalists to agriculture specialists, everything is there. There are um, trainings that are organized for almost every profession that you can imagine. Um, so I, 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 I focus on a few cases. Uh, of which I will talk about today, uh, two of them, and uh, including professionalization trainings for journalists, um, a topic that's, that's, uh, that, that has come up in uh, many presentations by my colleagues in the previous days, 
and also professionalization trainings for the military and security sector, which is something that I'm more and more interested in uh, recently. Um, so, what do we know about these professionalization trainings? Right? So the question is, what do we know about them? Um, they oftentimes can be um, either short-term professionalization trainings or long-term. So short-term uh, professionalization trainings can be uh, a week to up to two weeks, and some of them can be months at a time, which will be uh, Chinese government sort of puts out the call for participation. Uh, embassies, Chinese embassies in different African countries, monitor sort of these uh, the applications, and they decide on sort of what the final list is for whoever contributes or participates in these professionalization trainings. Most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, the participants which get listed uh, are invited to China, right? So they travel to China and they attend these seminars, these trainings, these developmental capacity building uh, programs, right? So they stay, uh, like I said, anywhere from a week to a couple of weeks to, to, to extended professionalization trainings, which can be months at a time, right? Uh, some of the journalists I talked to in Beijing were there for a year uh, as part of this capacity building program. And some are there for really short trips. Um, what, um, um, we also know that um, if, you picked up, <coughs> if you picked up on this uh, <coughs> excuse me, China Africa Forum, which happens every three years, uh, many of my colleagues have mentioned it. The first one was in 2000. And then it, every three years it takes place. It's just a big summit between China and African countries. Oftentimes this, this forum or the summit, that's where uh, details about how many capacity building programs are, uh, are going to be organized. Right? So that's, when we, when, that's where we go to look at the numbers. Um, so 10,000 um, <coughs> capacity building programs or training 10,000 uh, journalists, for example, was listed as part of the action plan of the former of the last uh, China Africa summit, right? Yeah. What language do they use to conduct these training sessions? It's a very good question. I've seen that there are at least four languages, um, and uh, for Af for for francophone African participants, most most of the uh, of them from Western Africa, the trainings tend to be conducted in French. Um, and some in English, uh, some in Portuguese for Lusophone African countries. I've also seen some in Arabic uh, for a lot of North African uh, uh, participants you know, from, from North African countries. Um, the extent to which language uh, is efficient is sometimes put into question. So most of the trainings which are conducted in English tend to be more smooth in terms of communication. Sometimes the ones in other languages may, I mean, because if you, if you can imagine, actually even Portuguese, the kind of Portuguese that's spoken in African countries is not the same Portuguese language or Portuguese dialect that's spoken you know, in, 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 um, in Europe or in, even in Macau, for example, which is where China would look for these connections, right, because of Macau's history. Um, um, so, but, but, but a lot of them also in English. Um, so, the capacity building programs is something that we, when, whenever you look at these action plans, every time that there's a summit, you see that the numbers for capacity building programs goes up. So the number is always going up. So every time China promises more and more capacity building programs. These investments in human resource development is something that has been picking up speed and momentum in China-Africa relations over the past few years. Now, with the Belt and Road, so a lot of my colleagues have been talking about this, uh, we see even more focus on capacity building programs, connecting China-Africa relations to this Belt and Road initiative, and talking about these uh, investments in, 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 in human uh, resources or in capacity building programs. Right? Some countries in Africa have uh, a set of a delegation, a number of people that they send annually. Um, so some, some of these capacity building programs are negotiated bilaterally, so between the Chinese government and an African host or an African country. So they would send delegations, you know, we have a quota, a certain number that you, you send participants every year. And others are, you know, just depending on the topic, depending on your interest, uh, then you send certain delegations. 
Um, the first case that I want to talk about today, and it's a uh, uh, subject of, of my research, is trainings for journalists, media trainings. Right, so this is one important area, and there have been increasing numbers of professionalization trainings by China offered for African journalists. And oftentimes, what we know about these journalists or these trainings is that um, in my interviews, I found that some uh, journalists, as I mentioned, would go to China for a long period of training. Right? So they would go for almost up to 12 months. Uh, but others go for quick technical training, which, which, which is two, two to four weeks at the most. Uh, what's really interesting about these trips is that they include sort of this technical training, but they also include uh, tours, taking the participants around different cities in China taking them around to see, essentially to really showcase China's capacities and cap capabilities for development. So a lot of these trips include uh, taking, taking participants to these mega cities built by China and sort of showing pictures from 30, 40 years ago to see the difference, to, 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 to experience firsthand China's development success. And if we're thinking about soft power, that is China's most powerful soft power mode, is to show the, the success of its development story. And if you are a developing country, from an African country somewhere, and you can see firsthand how a development can happen in over 30, 40 years, which is not a lot, and you can see the, 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 the before and after, that impact is very big, whether you're a journalist or a civil servant or a public official or any number of these um, participants in these investments. Right? So there is a big impact that comes with sort of showing or showcasing China's capabilities. Um, and that's something common to, to all the interviews I did about these, uh, these vocational trainings, that there is an element of this that takes this, this tour, looking at you know, an inner province, what it looks like, looking at Shanghai, what it looks like, see the difference for yourself, right? That type of thing is very important. Um, this was a piece that was published yesterday uh, by Voice of America. This was just yesterday, came in uh, uh, yesterday morning. And um, if you look at it, the, 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 there is a almost what a Chinese uh, scholar described, almost like a media war uh, between how the West views China-Africa relations, how China views China-Africa relations, how Africa views China-Africa relations, right? Um, and if you look at it, the crux of the argument by Salem Solomon in this piece uh, is to essentially say that Chinese media in Africa turn to uh, attempt to uh, uh, look away from questions and issues of corruption, of human rights. They do not cover these things, rather they cover sort of the positive spin on what Chinese investments have been doing in Africa. So this was the crux of the Voice of America kind of piece, right? Uh, and uh, essentially, you can just read here. I mean, it's quite small print, but but that's the the, the, the argument. Um, the purpose in my interviews, um, the purpose of organizing as many and as frequent of these vocational training programs for journalists from the Chinese government perspective, is that there is a discursive field, there's a discursive space, there's a media space that is taken over by Western media and Western perspective in Africa that China needs to reclaim, that China needs to, 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 to stand up to and provide a counter narrative. So that's the interest, right? That is the interest most of the time. But there is, but, but, and, and, and you can see the illustration of such a space as you can see it in this piece by Voice of America, right? But there is an overall narrative uh, about the representation of China's activities and investments in Africa that tends to be positive in Western media, tends to be negative in Western media, right? That uh, the Chinese government realizes that that might be a big sort of weakness in trying to win hearts and minds, in trying to gain reputation, in trying to gain interests, um, and have a positive impact in its relationship with, with African countries. One way to handle this 
as one of my colleagues said yesterday, journalists are the ones who are going to go back and report. They are the ones who are going to paint these pictures. They are the ones who are going to go back and write the stories. Right? So inviting the hundreds and hundreds of African journalists to China, <coughs> trying to impact them, trying to show them, trying to, uh, uh, that has or is viewed as having an impact on the way that they perceive China, Africa. At the very least, it would not necessarily be picking up content from BBC, CNN, France 24, Voice of America, and reprinting it. But it would be having the capacity, building capacity, to report on questions of China, Africa locally, and not having to use discourse or reprint stories from bigger outlets. That is a big importance there. So it's a huge investment. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, good morning. A uh, question regarding the invitation of the journalist. Um, where are they coming from in Africa? Uh, and also, um, is, it, uh, is there a name of the most prominent journalist that you could give us if we wanted to research this individual or these individuals to see the, kinds of, the kind of work they've done regarding reporting? on this relationship, where there are some key mm -hmm. names, and where are they coming from in Africa? Yeah, that's a really good question. They're coming from all over. Okay. Um, um, a lot of them, so China has a media hub in Nairobi, which I will talk about in a minute. And the media hub includes uh, huge offices for China's central TV in Africa. And that office hires about 200 African journalists and editors and people who work on different types of content, uh, online content, all kinds of things. And, and they are from mostly uh, Anglophone African countries, Eastern African countries, a lot of them are from Kenya, but also from Uganda, from South Africa, from different places. And the ones who are, for example, working for the CCT, for the Chinese TV uh, channel in Africa, um, I mean, there are key names because it's, you know, you see them on shows. Beatrice Marshall, for example, is one of them. Uh, but the others who are not necessarily working at the Chinese uh, TV in Nairobi work at different levels of media, some print, some uh, visual, or some radio uh, stations. In a lot of African countries, radio news content is more popular than print. So you would have to tune into some local radio station uh, because print might not be so popular or might not be very accessible. So you, you have it uh, more radio content. Um, in in some cases also, what I've seen from these participants, they can also be the PR uh, liaison people for their for their government. So they can work for a ministry. Uh, they they don't always uh, necessarily are journalists. They can also be liaison officers and uh, people who work for PR. Okay. Thank you. At different ministries, ministries, yeah, or departments. I'm interested to know is there any coordination or linkages at all with Al Jazeera in the area between what China is doing with journalism and training in Al Jazeera? Not that I have seen. Um, I know that there are um, mo most of the big international news stations have offices in Nairobi that tend to be the place for a lot of a lot of them to cover the entire continent. Um, <clears throat> so Al Jazeera definitely has an office, BBC, CNN, all of these have an office in Nairobi, which is where China has the headquarters of its TV and uh, media um, in, in Africa, which doesn't just include the TV, but a lot of other things which I will cover in a minute. Um, and that tends to be the extent of it. I don't think that there are necessarily coordinations. I don't think that there's necessarily competition or cooperation uh, among these uh, different outlets. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what's really interesting about the um, sending <coughs> these sort of big numbers of African journalists to, to China is um, there, there was a, besides the, this, this small fact, there was a, a statistic that says um, that China is now by far the number one destination of uh, the largest groups of, of, of African students. Uh, so it, 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 it's not the UK, it's not the US, it's not any Western country. It is in China that most Africans choose to go get their degrees. 
whether it's in journalism, communication, or any other thing. So it is actually hosting more African students, especially Francophone, I mean Anglophone African uh, students. Uh, and what's really interesting about some of these uh, capacity building programs for journalists is that I've talked to a lot of them who would who, who have finished their invited workshop and then they go back to China to get a degree, to get a master's degree or a PhD. They, they choose to pay out of pocket or to discuss it and negotiate it with their governments to go back to China and get into most of, most of the time uh, in Beijing, there's a university called China, uh, Communication University of China, CUC. And that's the one where uh, there's a whole program to host these practitioners from Africa who, who want to go back and get a degree. But what's really interesting about this is that if you look at the World Press Freedom Index, uh, out of 180 countries, actually, China ranks 176. Ghana ranks in the 30s, right? And to see Ghanaian journalists sort of going to China to get training is, is, is quite impressive. Um, and so what's really interesting to me is, is, is to kind of dig a little bit deeper into these professionalization training programs and see what is being taught, what is the curriculum looking like, uh, what is going on in these trainings. So that's essentially the point or the whole big sort of argument and the contribution to the field of China Africa that I want to make is looking at these norms, looking at you know <coughs> the intangibles, looking at these investments in <coughs> what I called in the first slide knowledge production, right? So getting training, um, what does it mean? Are are there any norms that are influenced or focused on more than others? Of course, we see something here, some some indication here in this little piece here in this paragraph. It indicates a little bit this aspect that China does not focus on anti-corruption. So if you're a journalist and you're going to get trained in China, some of the, there are certain red lines you don't cross. And these red lines oftentimes include negative reporting on government activities, reporting on human rights, reporting that has to do with governance, reporting that has to do with sort of democratization norms that we that we're often familiar with when it comes to, 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 to sort of a Western liberal uh, uh, order, right? So these are really interesting questions. When I get training, what do I get with it? What do I learn with it? Is it, what is it? What do I come back with? And that helps me also figure out, I mean, if you're the Chinese ministries, um, if you're investing in a road, it's really easy to calculate your return on investment because you know how much you put in it, you know how much you can get out of it, and then you can figure out a return of investment. When you're investing in mines, when you're investing in knowledge production, when you're investing in human resources, how do you figure out the return on investment? What is it exactly that you get, you, you get back? Yeah. Um, when talking to people who've done the program, does it seem like they kind of I mean, usually I mean, people are pretty savvy, like they know what they're getting into when dealing with countries that are pretty open about their attitude towards the press. Um, do they kind of enter it with a thought like, well, I can get this technical experience and I can go back home and report on the things I want to report on, even if that's government corruption or even if that's, you know, issues that maybe the Chinese government doesn't really think should be reported on? Um, or is it that they're like targeting people who are less savvy and trying to get them to go into media to try to balance out people that are already there. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one of the most sort of pedagogical points to make about China Africa stories or China Africa issues is that it's always a mixed bag. Every uh, you know every issue, the answer is almost never yes, totally or no. Totally. It's usually a mixed bag. Uh, it's just, just such a huge, obviously we're talking about an entire continent, we're talking about so many different cases. I bet you can find a case of what you described earlier and a, and a, and a case of what you described later. In my, in my, in my interviews though, um, I don't think that I found um, journalists to um, compromise or to think that they have to compromise their integrity at all because of the trainings. Um, you, most of them uh, sort of get an, a, a deeper understanding of China, China's history. Uh, has there been a retaliation against some journalists, for example, who might describe Taiwan as an independent country? Maybe they may get refused access to China next time they try to go, or they may get some, you know, 
privileges revoked or something, but it's not something that I have seen the big uh, sort of looming condition that if you participate in this workshop, you're going to forget about uh, you know, other uh, trainings or something. Um, so some of, the, some of the concerns from the Chinese side, some of the concerns about the way Western media, right? so what in your imagination, what is, what could be part of this Western media representation of China in Africa? What do you hear about China in Africa as a representation? Yeah. That, that, that it's like a new colonialism. Yes, new colonialism, right? What else? It's almost never a flattering image. It's oftentimes a cautionary tale, right? Um, so this story was published last week, I'm sorry, in The Guardian. And it's a story about Belt and Road. It's about the Belt and Road. And this is a train that's departing from a Chinese city. It's going to Germany. And it is a part of the Belt and Road. It's part of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's a train that's connecting a Chinese city to what you see here, Dreyborg Port. And I apologize, I do not speak German, but it's a port. And it's, it's called the uh, China Europe Block Train. And it, the, it's connecting Weihai Port to this Dreyborg, I think it's Dreyborg. What's really interesting about the way that The Guardian reports on this is the following. Check out this small little paragraph. Yeah, see, just work. Thank you. And it's, and it's the Belt and Road, you see? Check out this uh, quick quote. Is The Guardian warning German people of the Belt and Road? Is there an alarming tone to this? Very positive, very flattering. It's about investments. It's going to be good. It's a question of pride that the, that the, that the town is put on the map because of the port. Had this been a, a train that's going to Djibouti, what do you think the Guardian would be saying? So there is a, there is a little bit of an irony as to how Western media sometimes is patronizing in its reporting of China-Africa stories. When you look at China's investments in Europe are oftentimes viewed as welcome. They're oftentimes viewed as, as, if, as if African citizens and nations and countries and leaders need the tutorial or the warning or the manual of instruction, right, that comes with uh, reporting on China-Africa issues. You have to be careful. Debt, right? I mean, and you see it. Exactly what you just said. This is where all economists, and I do not mean to pick on the economists, I wrote an article on um, the economist cartoons and how they represent China-Africa China -Africa, uh, relations. And so I'm always interested to see. But what you see here, you know, the depiction of China as a dragon, and uh, there's always darkness and looming. And this is quite clear. It says colonialists. There's no hiding there. And the globe. And the dragon is looking at it as if there are these big plans that China is hiding under and the economist is basically unraveling. Um, so you see this narrative come up and up and, you know, time and time and time again. Uh, more narratives. Actually, I'm going to come back to this one in a minute. Uh, sorry about this not being super clear, but in 2000, the economist representation of the entire African continent, if you see the map, it says the hopeless continent. And it's all about conflict, it's all about poverty, it's all about war. What do you, th what do you think happened in 2000 when it came to China-Africa relation? What, what was the year 2000 known for? The first forum of China-Africa relations happened in the year 2000. And the forum of China-Africa relations was this sort of big summit where, where, where Chinese government essentially you know, rolled red carpets to welcome African leaders to discuss the investments and the hope and the Africa as a place for potential lots of money, Chinese investments uh, to be made. In the same year, the economist is stuck in its representation of the continent as a place of conflict, as a place of war, as a place of poverty. 
quickly, and 10, 10, 10 years later, the economist shifts its perception. It's now thinking about Africa rising. Why do you think so? It's because of China's connection to Africa that sort of created this competition, created this narrative that, hey, wait a second, maybe that's not just a continent for poverty, maybe that's not just a continent for conflict, maybe there are investments to be made there. So it's really interesting to see. One way of countering this uh, uh, sort of this, this very alarmist depiction of China-Africa relations by the Chinese government has always been, uh, and now is, is sort of putting out um, what used to be called CCTV Africa. It's not called CCTV Africa anymore. It's called CCTGN. Um, if I were to guess why, it's possible that it has something to do with the aesthetics of what CCTV Africa may sound like especially if you're thinking CCTV, surveillance, cameras type of thing, where CCTV is the Chinese sort of central TV, right? But now it's called CTGN or C CTGN, Global Network, right? So, it's, yeah, CTGN. Um, the headquarters of uh, CTGN or CCTV Africa are in Nairobi. The building is huge. It is the only international news group that has a, an actual headquarters in all of Africa. Usually you find a bureau, small little office. Most of the time that's what correspondents have. Would have one person or one office or one bureau of, of a handful of staff, not just one. But, but, but tends to be sort of at a, a much more marginalized level. Um, and Nairobi does not only have sort of the influence of CCTV, it also has Xinhua. Uh, has uh, China Daily has an Africa Weekly edition that it runs, prints uh, and distributes. Um, I found this and I, was, I thought it was interesting, especially in light of one of my colleagues' presentations about Korean drama being translated and dubbed in Arabic. So I thought, I found this and I put it here. I really don't know much about it, except that this was really interesting. <coughs> Uh, to see that there is a Marathi Chinese TV series. Uh, this is Hikayat Lala, but I don't know if it's uh, Lala's story or what really is in, in, in English. Um, but it looks to be a popular Chinese TV series which Morocco has uh, just announced to be interested in dubbing in Arabic. So that's really kind of interesting there. And it's CGTN, which is the TV station that I was just talking about. Xinhua also has its African Regional Bureau, and like I said, China Daily has an Africa Weekly edition um, that is printed. Uh, are these popular networks in Africa? Do people watch these channels? Most of the time, no. Right? Most of the time, they're not popular. They're not, they don't have wide audience. A lot of people do not access the China Daily Africa Weekly is not widely distributed. You find it, but it's not widely distributed. Um, CTGN, no, CGTN, China's global TV network or something, right? Uh, CGTN, um, as is often the case in China-Africa relations, they tend to be government-to-government -government relations. So this, uh, for, 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 for CGTN to, to, to broadcast its uh, products or content into Kenya's TV, it usually does it through state China, not the private one. Oftentimes, people don't tend to watch a lot of state-owned TV channels in a lot of African countries. You go for the private ones, a little bit more freedom towards what you do and what you say. Uh, oftentimes, if you want to, to watch CGTN, you have to tune into the state-owned media. So they're not very popular. And the point um, here is, it is more interesting, and you see a bigger scope and scale of Chinese investments in human resources of bringing journalists from Africa to China for training than, than, than what you get out of the material, what you get out of this infrastructure. Right? So that this, this, this huge infrastructure, however big the headquarters of the Chinese TV are in Nairobi, they don't have much of an effect. But it's in the exchanges between journalists, it's in the trainings of journalists that you see a lot of the impact, right? Um, this was a, a group of journalists from different African countries who were attending CUC, and I got to 
hang out with them a little bit, do some interviews, see what they study, um, talk to them about their impressions. They were from all over. Um, but it was just an interesting group of um, young journalists who um, had not before this trip ever uh, had a first-hand exposure of China. The, um, everything they knew about China were the stereotypes that basically came from Western media. Right? Um, um, and uh, in my conversations with them, um, some of the most memorable things that they could talk about is just this idea of discovering China for themselves, knowing what China uh, is about for themselves. Um, I, for the most part, their, 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 um, their impressions of China have, have been uh, extremely positive. Uh, being able to go there, being able to learn about China's history, China's culture, getting used to the food, uh, staying in the country for more than two weeks, uh, talking to people, developing bonds and connections to a lot of classmates and professors and colleagues, and uh, these things were really important to them. Um, but at the same time, what I don't, uh, what I want to sort of show in the next few slides is also the, the fact that there is a resistance or there is a very, I want to say, kind of independent or authentic voice of a lot of African journalists uh, who don't necessarily buy into either the Western narrative or the Chinese narrative, because oftentimes, you know, it becomes such this, this is such a polarized topic. That either you criticize China and you're pro-Western, or you love China and you're anti-Western. You cannot be both. You cannot be your own thing. You have to be either or. Uh, yet, what I wanted to show, despite that these um, huge investments in bringing in the journalists, thousands, we're talking in thousands of journalists to China, that there is um, a lot of resistance on the ground. There are uh, all kinds of. Um, Journalists, my favorite type of resistance uh, that I want to show and I use in my classes a lot, and like I said, I wrote an article on this, is the use of cartoons. Uh, and this was a Ghanaian uh, cartoonist, uh, Bright Tete Agut. Uh, some of these are extremely controversial if you can take a look at what the meanings are, right? And what oftentimes perhaps cannot be expressed in print because of fear of some retaliation or other, I just put it in a cartoon. It's very, uh, it's kind of fun. It's also funny. It's controversial, disturbing in ways other than you have to read, you know, some huge long investigative report. Um, but these sort of express a lot of opinions, a lot of sentiments. As we know, Ghana has a lot of gold, and um, a lot of Chinese companies are uh, sometimes accused of illegal gold mining uh, in Ghana. And it's something that has been sort of uh, surfacing. So in the way that you see C C CGTN, for example, is not going to report on controversies around the gold mining, for example. Um, and, but still, even despite sort of China's big sort of power dynamics, right? Because there are a lot of power dynamics that are in, embedded in these vocational training programs. I bring you in, I pay for you, I get you here, you stay two weeks to two, two, almost to a year sometimes. There are lots of power dynamics that go into that. But at the same time, that, that also creates a lot of resistance. Right? It's creating a lot of resistance by uh, local journalists. So these are supposed to be African leaders, in Nigeria, Ghana, see? This is uh, the Chinese ambassador in, uh, in, in uh, Ghana. Uh, you, you can imagine sort of, so this is about the gold, gold mining, as you can see. So it's called gold and gold here, essentially putting it in what looks to be China uh, made, or China jars. And he's given a little bit back to some African leaders in there. Um, this is the map of Africa. As you can see, President Xi Jinping trying to take <coughs> away. So some of the, some of the stuff is, extremely controversial. What's really interesting about this, I think, was, was really the, uh, um, a really interesting or funny uh, twist to the story, is that this uh, cartoonist had a huge exhibit in a crop, and he had you know, all of these cartoons um, displayed. And this is just a sample. Obviously, as you can imagine, there are uh, a ton more of these. And during the exhibit, as you can see, 
Uh, this was another one, another cartoon. As you can see, can you guess who this is? <laughs> <laughs> who is it? Yeah, yeah, it is China's ambassador to Ghana who's taking a picture next to this. <laughs> Why? Take a joke. Sure. The, 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 the Chinese government is also open to listening. Right? That these are criticisms and we're open to to talk about it. I'm not going to just, you know, be angry at it and slam the door and you know and shut the conversations. But she's she's taking a picture and yeah, you can miss it. You did a good job. Yeah. Right? You did a good job. Um Galamsi, this is the sign behind him says Galamsi, has to do with has to do with this uh, gold mining in Ghana. This was a few years ago, a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half or two years ago. Um, there is a new, another um, cartoonist out of Kenya this time. His name is uh, Michael Swap, or sorry, I think it's probably pronounced it, who is. Uh, also creating a lot of controversy through cartoons. And as you can see, this one is about the African Union, which is headquarters in Addis Ababa, headquarters of which I showed you in the, one of the first slides were built by China, huge influence there. And you can see the chairman of the African Union of 2030 looks to be Chinese. And everybody else is practically what? Right. Um, you know, there's South Africa, Kenya, probably Ghana, you know. Um, and the idea is that um, it's clear, right? That there's this sort of controversy about who is running the ship, basically. Um, it's something that Michael sort has been doing. These are a couple more of his, a couple more of his um, cartoons. There are, of course, a lot more. Um, Tusker is a local uh, beer, it's a Kenyan beer. And as you can see, China, Africa uh, here, China loves Africa, but at the same time, there's you know, Tusk be being taken out of the symbol. So there's a lot of controversy, a lot of symbolism, and a lot of activism that goes into these cartoons. Yeah, yeah but if we see historical context, actually, it's not really very strange that China and Africa a quote end quote re-establish uh, the the two continent and subcontinent because uh, the two relationship actually were close in the 50s for the Asia Africa uh, conference in Bandung in 1955. So uh, at that time they together confronted the white colonialism. So um, and also culturally the two, Africa and China, are closer than, for example, with the white Euro European and uh, America, I should say. So to me, uh, maybe because I'm Asian American, I see it very possible. Yeah, yeah no, you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of this discourse is, is couched very much in this history of solidarity, the Bandung spirit, um, the, 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 the solidarity between China and the rest of the Global South, frankly, a lot of African countries, specifically because of their, uh, during their wars of independence against European powers. Um, so yes, it is, it is essentially, if you look at these binaries that are created today, it, you can trace them back to this discourse of Bandung, uh, spirit, you can trace them to this anti-hegemony solidarity that you used to sort of, that, that you just described. A lot of it hasn't gone anywhere, um, but at the same time, uh, what you see is uh, maybe a little bit more assertiveness from the part of perhaps China to be interested in creating its own narrative rather than just countering and playing defense in terms of what the West is trying to paint or what image the Western media is painting in Africa. There's a little bit more maybe proactive uh, measures that are... Yes, um, because taken. their interest is more economic than political. Yeah, certainly. certainly. Yeah. 
I'm wondering, um, just because the examples you're giving of pushback are all cartoonists, are cartoonists also included in the exchanges? Like, are they also going to China for these programs, or is it only people trying to work with? It's a really good question. I haven't, I haven't actually personally encountered any cases of cartoonists being involved in any of these trainings. Um, oftentimes, because if these trainings include any technical capacity or any technical trainings, you know, there's not much you can do about that. But it will be really interesting to follow specifically these two examples and see over the years uh, what is their perception of China-Africa relations, what's their connection or uh, to both, you know, Ghanaian and Kenyan government and to the Chinese government. It would be, be interesting to follow that. But, but short of that, I really have not encountered any cases um, of cartoonists being trained in China. I was just interested in what Mimi said about the China's interest being economic. Mm -hmm. Whereas that one cartoonist, it, it showed the, the African leaders being asleep and then the, the chairman would be a Chinese gentleman later. So I think there's, it's really involved. There's a lot going on. And, um, yeah, there, yeah. There's a lot going on though. I think also if perhaps the difference or the point you were alluding to, maybe that the difference between China-Africa relations in the 50s and today is that it was more ideological then than it is now. It's perhaps more framed by development, economic interests, trade, investments, these things, rather than it is. There's a hegemonic threat that's from Western countries, we're going to defeat it. Uh, it's not so much more about that than it is about their interests that China has in the continent willing to, you know, both expand and protect them. So. I didn't quite get this one very, very much. I don't know if there are things that are missing, but Xi Jinping, and then you get all these mugs. Perhaps China is feeding these countries. I don't know what exactly it's saying. Um, but if anything, Maybe something like drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah, could be. Tea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it could be that. Yeah. He also has a. Soy has another cartoon where um, there was this controversy in 2015. There was the Biennale uh, Festival, and the pavilion that was supposed to be Kenya's pavilion was represented by Chinese artists uh, who did not do any work related to Africa. We also uh, had a series of cartoons to make sort of fun of that situation, uh, of that controversy of why would, why, would it, well, why would the Kenyan pavilion feature zero Kenyan artists and all Chinese artists, what, what's going on. Um, so yeah, they, these are um, you know, kind of interesting backlash or, or, or pushing back against uh, these investments and, and, and to just put things into perspective for us that Africans are not just you know, agent, agency free of agency, um, you know, just take them into these trainings and then easily manipulate it, put them back in and they become sort of agents of this Chinese propaganda or something, right? So just wanted to show a bit of a, what, you know, what the other side of the point looks like. And there is criticism on the ground, but there is, you know, controversy. The second topic, um, so that I don't really use up too much time and hopefully we'll have some Q&A time, the second topic, or the second case that I will explore today um, is uh, re related to capacity building programs for uh, security and military officers, uh, African security and military officers. And it's something that I've been more and more interested in um, recently. And um, obviously, when we talk about military or security relations between China and Africa, it's one of the topics that is the uh, most recent development in China and Africa relations. It's, it's in the past really been mostly about economic relations, it's, it's about development, but because of the, the principles of um, co peaceful coexistence, because of principles of non-interference, because of principles of sovereignty, uh, China has a little bit shied away from being involved in questions of security and questions of military um, until recently. Um, so it wasn't until 2005 2006 that we see the first appearances of these uh, questions related to, to security being, being discussed in the China-Africa relations. 
that uh, although um, uh, in, the, in the last decade there's been a steady increase in the uh, willingness and extent to which uh, China is both willing and capable to, to be involved in, in, in questions relevant to security and military um, in Africa. So again, as I'm interested in these investments in human resource and invested, interested in capacity building programs, I ask the question, uh, um, you know, I look at trainings. I look at uh, training military officers, uh, African military officers and peacekeepers in, 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 in China. Um, of course, in terms of security relations, these are, this is not the only thing that's going on. This is the one thing that I'm focusing on. But there's a lot of arms sales, small arms sales. There are lots of uh, joint drills. There are lots of other things that are happening between China and African countries on the level of military. We also know that very recently, as of 2017, China inaugurated its first military base in Africa, and it's in the country of Djibouti. Um, you know, and uh, it is very possible that that's not going to be the only or only one uh, Chinese base in, in Africa. So there are lots of um, aspects to China's military or security um, uh, policy in Africa. But the one that I'm going to focus in and the one that I'm interested in is again this question of when you train peacekeepers, when you train uh, military attaches, what, 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 other, what, what is going on, right? What, what happens in these trainings? What kind of model, what kind of norms, what, are the, what, what kind of knowledge is produced or shared uh, or talked about in terms of, uh, of these trainings? Uh, training political or military attaches is not something that China created. The US has done this during the Cold War and has trained a lot of Japanese, for example, uh, military officers. Uh, the USSR provided uh, tons of these trainings for African military attaches, again, during the Cold War. Um, so it's not something new. It's not something that China created. Though, if you look at the scope and the scale of it, it's pretty impressive, um, the numbers, right, and how um, China is training um, thousands of military attaches and peacekeepers uh, in China. So about Chinese peacekeepers, rough numbers, just to give you an idea. Uh, China is the largest provider of peacekeeping and troops, largest of, of, of uh, United Nations Security Council permanent members. Uh, actually, more than all of them put together, if you look at this small table that I put here. So China has uh, a little bit less than this number now because the mission in Liberia has ended since this table has been put there. Um, but, but it's more than all of the others combined. What's interesting is that not only are Chinese peacekeepers physically more, more there are more Chinese peacekeepers on the ground in African countries that are hosting these uh, missions, but it's also the interesting that China is positioning itself as a hub for training peacekeepers. It's trying to, to, to become a place or destination to train peacekeepers as well. So it's really interesting. Uh, and when you look at what Chinese peacekeepers tend to do, uh, oftentimes they are not combat troops, um, although there are a few in regiments, about 700, um, who were uh, sent to uh, Sudan. Most of most of the others are non-combat. They are they are they are engineers. They are doctors. They are paramedical teams. What they often do is, as you can see in this picture, you know, in this case, it was a, 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 a group of peacekeepers, Chinese peacekeepers, who actually built the school. And this was a, in, a, in, a, in a small village in a, in a city, in, in a, outside of a city in Congo, in the DRC. So they built this school and they're teaching Chinese, for example. Right? Um, so it's not, you know, um, it's not the typical image of a blue helmet that you have. Right? This extremely militarized, very armed, completely isolated in some really high securitized compound. Not at all. Right? Built in, built in a village. Built, actually, they built the school for for orphans, for conflict orphans. So there's a lot of uh, soft power that's included or involved in in, in in the presence of Chinese peacekeepers um, in Africa. This quote here was by a uh, former uh, prime minister of Mali. Again, talks about how uh, Chinese peacekeepers focus on development projects. They they get drinking water for the local people, they pave the roads, they build the school. 
Uh, and, and, the, and the report is this idea of bringing hearts and minds of the Mali and people. There's this idea of giving a, presenting a positive image. As you can imagine, there are lots of scandals that come out of many African countries about blue helmets. Uh, lots of sexual abuse, lots of... Um, so the, 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 oftentimes the Chinese peacekeepers are very much aware of these um, bad reputation, you know, uh, issues with, with, with blue helmets, and they, they try to uh, be a little bit forceful about presenting a different image, right? These are the countries where you could see Chinese peacekeepers um, in blue, so you could see them in Mali. Although in Liberia, like I said, the mission actually ended, so this is uh, not super accurate anymore. The DRC in South Sudan. Now, actually, China is the second financial contributor. It's actually more than Japan. Uh, so, again, it perhaps needs to be updated a little bit. But that just gives you an idea. Can I ask, is there, what is the training? Uh, is there a specific program that these train the trainers and the, the, uh, for the blue helmets are going through in China? Is there a specific school? Have we heard from a previous speaker that the former head of Blackwater has like a School of Warriors and has started in China. So I'm just wondering, is this a particular? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, um, I'm not sure about what uh, Blackwater is, but if I were to guess, it might be private security. Mm -hmm. And that might not, that might be completely different from these trainings. So that's, that would be perhaps trainings for private security agents. Uh, but, which is what, you know, what, what it does, you know, everywhere else in the world. But in terms of UN peacekeeping troops, there are academies in, in China, two of them now, that, uh, that provide uh, training for African peacekeepers. Uh, one of them was just outside of Beijing, which I, uh, I, I was very uh, privileged to actually have access to visit. And it's uh, a police training center. So these are peacekeepers who are police units. Um, uh, military units are a little bit more difficult to have access to. Police academies are a little bit easier, they're a little bit more open about um, you know, allowing mundane scholars such as myself to actually have access to the base, to have access to, to, the, to the training centers. Um, this was a show actually put together by the, by the units um, to sort of show the technical skills that, that, that these, um, this was a rapid response team. Um, they were doing lots of uh, shows to basically um, demonstrate to us what the peace, peacekeepers actually learn in the trainings. Um, so the, the, the trainings are, some of them are just seminars. That you go and you attend the seminar, you take classes. Uh, and some are technical trainings, uh, like, like what you can see on the picture here. Um, and then when the peacekeepers are done with the training, they have actually to take a test that uh, high level UN officials uh, observe and uh, evaluate, and if they pass, then they become officially trained peacekeepers. Uh, this center prides itself over basically providing such uh, high quality training that most people, or all people actually who have gone through this, have passed the, 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 the UN test. So it's not uh, very arbitrary in that sense. It's not. It's not a parallel, or it's not a. It's actually uh, very much integrated with the UN peacekeeping training program. Yeah. It's very surprising to me because I have knowledge about this. But uh, that China is the largest uh, provider of peacekeepers. Uh, in other articles it says uh, China is being criticized for providing very little aid to other countries. So how is it different? So peacekeepers are different from the aid or yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the numbers may be a little bit tricky because uh, as you could see in the, in, in, in the slide here, these are, these are UN Security Council permanent members, right? So when you look at this group, China, US, France, UK, Russia, China is the largest provider of peacekeepers. But that's, but that's, in, but that's only talking about United Nations Security Council permanent members, the P5. 
right? Uh, Bangladesh provides peacekeeping troops in the in the tens of thousands, right? Pakistan as well. Ethiopia does provide uh, in the tens of thousands, right? So in that case, when you compare how much Ethiopia actually provides in terms of peacekeepers to China, China is not much at all. But when you when you combine the fact that China is a P5 country and China is the second largest financial uh, contributor to peacekeeping budget, and China is now also growing as a hub to peacekeeping trainings, it becomes a really interesting place. Because although the US is the largest uh, uh, key contributor in terms of budget, the US does not contribute actual peacekeepers. You see, it's 82. Um, so, but China is this intersection of willingness, capacity, uh, financial support, uh, and, and, and also training, providing training for it. So it's this intersection of everything together, right? So that, that's what makes it a really interesting case. Um, but as of 1990, for example, if you think about it, China was actually not, um, was basically vetoing every um, humanitarian intervention um, UN resolution, right? So it was not actually interested in this, it was not participating, either between or completely just, you know, staying out of it uh, and not contributing officially to any of um, peacekeeping troops. And I think 1993 was the first time that China has uh, been involved and very carefully uh, and, and, and very in a very limited manner to peacekeeping uh, missions. And that's why. Up until then, China was criticized as a free rider, that um, all the other countries participated in providing this common good, which is peace and security in the world, and that China was, um, and that China was um, uh, free riding and uh, not contributing. And then since then, obviously we know because of the sovereignty, non-interference principle, a lot of these foreign policy principles that China goes by that. Uh, sending troops to another country does not look good if you pride yourself on being the anti-hegemon, if you pride yourself on being anti-interventionist. You know, uh, but, but, but there's been gradual change in that policy and in a matter of two decades we're talking about you know, one of the largest contributions both financially and in terms of personnel and in terms of training to, China, to peacekeepers. Right? So. I don't probably expect a deep answer on this, but whenever, I mean, if we're seeing how this kind of soft power is impacting um, Africans, I'm wondering if there's any data on how it's impacting Chinese participants in these processes, and how it's affecting, you know, the, the, the governmental entities that are sending them. I mean, if there's this much change in this short of a time, it must be having an impact not just you know thinking about African agency, but also the agency of, of the Chinese who are participating in this process, how it's changing their worldview. Do we have any any data or information on that at all? I mean, I think the, I think, I think it's, a, it's a really good point. I don't think there is a lot of data on this. And it is definitely um, something I raised to my attention that I didn't really think much about. But in my, um, in my conversations with a lot of the trainers, for example, I think the, the, the world view is a really good point, is that it really puts um, uh, an understanding of China as a, um, a, a great power that's contributing uh, proactively to questions of peace and security in the world, rather than you know, watching or supporting. Um, so to my sense, that is the biggest uh, change, is this realization that there is you know, the, the political will, the economic capacity to participate and to contribute um, aggressively to questions of peacekeeping and peacekeeping problems. Um, that's changing a little bit. And, and, and I talked to several officers at the police academy training, and there's a little bit even, um, there's a little bit of, um, of an, um, um, an ease or an uncomfort with how the UN is not actually really engaging ideas from Chinese peacekeeping training academies as much as it would engage ideas from other OECD countries, for example. That there is a, an eagerness to take leadership role, um, that if met with um, openness, that, that there would be more leadership role being taken by all of these academies that are proven to be ready uh, to, 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 to you know, 
train, to provide all these skills uh, to peacekeepers. So. I mean, to end, just wanted to share some resources. Um, um, there is, like I said, I use a lot of cartoons in my class. You've, you've seen some of the really excellent films as visual uh, or media resources. Um, but I also use podcasts. And there's a great China Africa podcast that's very reliable, very puts content, uh, uh, an episode basically every week on any number of topic you can imagine that has to do with China Africa. It would be really interesting to just, you know, I assign the podcasts to students because, you know, it's just uh, accessible as something that they can listen to on the way to class or to the gym or uh, creates sometimes also a lot of conversations. I, I get you know, emails from students saying, oh, I listened to, to the latest episode, even though class is over four, four, four months ago. But they still email and say, I listen to this, I listen to the other. It just piques their interest. Um, so I thought to share that. Blog, uh, Ambassador David Chin was given a talk tomorrow. Runs an excellent newsletter with lots of news so um, uh, and articles. So that would be, if you want to subscribe to something that can give you a lot of content, articles, just keeps you updated about what's going on. That's a really easy, uh, easy one to go to. Um, Professor Park, who was here yesterday, is basically the executive director of the network Chinese in Africa, Africans in China, um, who's, which is now running a website, which will be launched in the next couple of weeks. The website should be caac.org. It will have all the resources, it will be good. A number of us teach China Africa classes, myself included. Um, so in case you know um, you wanted a copy of the syllabus or something, just to have an idea what to include in terms of content, if you're looking for an article on this, a chapter on the other, uh, get in touch you know, with me, uh, with a lot, any number of us who actually teach China Africa classes. I'm, I'm sure colleagues would be very happy to to assist. So I just wanted to close with this um, and just like leave my email here for that.